When an election is held in California, it is one of the biggest in the nation with 10 million voters and 900 candidates. In final charge of making those elections run in strict compliance with the law is a petite but very determined woman, Secretary of State Marge Fong Yu, highest ranking elected female official in the state. She is at the center of all the heated battles that develop over elections. She is a strong supporter of women's causes as well as the Equal Rights Amendment. KOCE TV now presents an exclusive interview with Marge Fong Yu for public television. And now here's your host, Jim Cooper. About 10 million voters in California are eligible to vote in the upcoming November 6th off-year election. And yet less than half are expected to turn out at the polls. Two ballot issues are of critical importance. One will have great impact on the question of busing children to achieve racial integration. The other will decide whether there will be a limit on the state's power to spend tax dollars. That's called the GAN initiative. Charged with responsibility for running these elections and certifying the results throughout the state is March Fong Yu, the Secretary of State of California. I'll talk with her tonight about that election and some other aspects of her job. March Fong Yu was elected to California's Secretary of State in 1974 and was re-elected in 1978. She's the first woman ever to be elected Secretary of State. Prior to her election as Secretary of State, Ms. Yu served four times in the California legislature representing Oakland and Castro Valley. She holds a master's degree from Mills College and a PhD in education from Stanford. She's been sharply critical of Governor Brown, charging that he had not done enough to promote business and industry in California. But I'd like to talk with you first just about the idea of an election, of an off-year election. And I know you've been going around the state trying to generate interest, to generate uh, voters coming out. Right. Uh, do you feel it's a lost cause sometimes, or do you get disenchanted? Oh, no, that? not at all. I think, um, in fact, um, I think the, the elections, I think, I think even this initiative process, which is becoming more and more popular, uh, really is comforting to me because it is a good example of people getting interested in the electoral process, albeit a different way than actually going in to vote, but at least it's comforting mm -hmm. to know that they are so uh, excited about some issue that they are uh, generating initiative drives. Some people have been critical of what they call government by initiative. Uh, some of the legislators have been critical of it, saying it's a bad way to run a railroad, as the expression goes. What do you think about that? Well, I can certainly appreciate the legislators saying that um, initiatives are a bad way to go because the only reason that many people go to our, for the initiative is that they feel that the lawmakers have naturally not done their job and so they take the job in their own hands. So it is, uh, uh, to speak, a way of saying to the legislators, look, you haven't been doing the job, so we're just doing it ourselves. One of the feelings of frustration that must occur to you is uh, being turned off uh, by voters, the failure of voters to vote, as we have on November 6th coming up, when, as we sit here, uh, the prediction is less than half of the voters will even trouble themselves to go to a polling place somewhere November 6th and cast a ballot. But I'd like to read uh, the study uh, of the U.S. Census Bureau. This is throughout the country. In the 1978 election, only 20% of the voters who are 18 to 20, only 20% of that age bracket bothered to vote in the 1978 election. In other words, 80% managed to stay home, compared to 60% who voted uh, in the age bracket of 55 to 64. In other words, the older people are voting and the younger people are not. And yet mm -hmm. we went to such, there was such an effort to get, to give to young people a vote. That's right. It's, um, it's, it's kind of ironic because uh, I was in the legislature at that time. We were fighting for the vote for the 18-year-old because they were, at that time, uh, the 21 year was a limit and we we fought so hard and they came up to the state capitol and lobbied so well their cause then once we gave them the vote they turned out to be almost the same voting in the same uh, proportion as the rest of the uh, country's voters mm -hmm. and so it was it, it is kind of discouraging to some respect it's, it's disenchanting to have young people apparently turned off with the system enough that they're not taking the trouble and yet uh, what other better system is there yes right well you know there are a lot of different theories about why people don't vote of course um, there is a theory that people are turned off they are um, they they are anti-government they're uh, discouraged with the political leaders they think their vote doesn't do any good and it's a general discontent with the system yet I've heard some theory that uh, well maybe if people deliberately don't 
go to vote, maybe they're satisfied with the system. So it's uh, they're just not mad enough to go to the polls to change it. So it's um, it's it's very difficult to to really assess why why um, why people don't turn out to vote. What about the fact that uh, people can register so much easier now? They can do it by a postcard, and I know you're an advocate of that. Do you feel that this is some kind of a reflection that? Perhaps it's been made too easy for people to vote, too easy to register to vote, rather. No, I don't think it's been made too easy. Because uh, what we've done is make it more more convenient, uh, to be sure. But um, I think what we're doing is just eliminating one one of the one of the previous obstacles to to voting and uh, make it possible to the, for them to register uh, by mail. Uh, there are other states that even make it simpler to to register to vote. Uh, there could, several states and I think of one in particular Minnesota where you can register right on election day you can go right into the polls and if you haven't registered up until that day you register right that day and uh, so it um, would you favor that for California I think it uh, I think it has uh, some difficulties oh. um, but I see no reason why we cannot reduce the time for reg right now mm -hmm. if you don't register be within 29 days of the mm -hmm. election you're out of luck well, I think that we ought to find some way of changing that law so that maybe we could register, say, up to 10 days, up to a mm -hmm. week before the election, because I know that some of the reason people uh, can't vote on Election Day is they don't get interested in the election until maybe the last two weeks or week when the campaigns are getting heat and, heated and, mm -hmm. and, and vigorous, and then they suddenly find out, oops, I forgot to register to vote. Uh, so consequently, they're just out of luck, and they just don't get interested maybe a, a month before the election. So if I had any way of doing it, and which I, in fact, I do, I'm, I'm planning to work with the legislature, see if we can change the law, and uh, which will allow them to mm -hmm. register, say, up to 10 days or one week before the election. I can sympathize with you. It seems uh, a shame that we have a country where that freedom does exist, uh, one of the great strengths of, of a democracy, democratic process that we have, and so many, so few people are going to use it, even on this November 6th election. Well, let's, uh, uh, we, we le let's, uh, let's, our, hope our pre let's hope that doesn't come true. I know the last um, s statewide special election we had was in... 1970, let's see, when was it? 1973, mm -hmm. we had a special statewide election, which was an off-year election, where people had to go in to vote just for a, a, an issue. Um, and we had about a 47% turnout then. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it will be better this time. Maybe the issues are more of interest to them. But I think the, the thing that generates people to go vote is um, whether the interest is great on an issue whether the candidates, uh, whether the candidates uh, are that exciting mm -hmm. to them, then they, then they turn out and go to go vote. Well, we have uh, two issues that should be uh, uh, both intellectually interesting and emotionally uh, interesting that ought to pull people out. One of them has to do with busing, and I'd like to talk a little bit about these four. But the first one had to do about buffing and busing, and the fourth one has to do with money, uh, the GAN initiative. But before we do that, I'd like to read one statement of a reflection of a new California field poll and get your thoughts on it. A recent California field poll indicates that only 30% of the public has heard or knows anything about Proposition 1, the anti-school busing proposal on the upcoming statewide ballot. And among the 30% that does know about it, there's a vast disagreement about the impact of the Proposition 1. One-third think it would increase school busing, one-third think it would decrease school busing, and one-third doesn't know what Proposition 1 would accomplish. Mm -hmm. That's kind of scary if that's true from a poll st standpoint. That is that is kind of scary, and uh, I think pro part of the reason could be that uh, the issue seems to be more interesting to the people of Southern California than it is to the people of Northern California. It is a mm -hmm. very controversial issue here because of the Los Angeles uh, situation involvement. Yes, right, right, right. Let's so, let's read uh, the wording that everyone will find when they walk on their, walk into the ballot place on November sixth on Proposition One. This is called school assignment and transportation of pupils. It provides that the U.S. Constitution will govern pupil uh, school assignment or pupil transportation in California. Financial impact indeterminable. Potential savings if school districts elect to reduce or eliminate pupil transportation or assignment programs as a result of this measure. And uh, but let's, ha let's have your reaction to that. Uh, some people have said that actually if you vote yes on it, it means no, you don't want to have 
the busing as planned now in Los Angeles. And if you vote no, and that means yes, uh, you do want to. So let's clarify that a little bit. Well, but you really are voting when you vote yes. Well, let's not make it more confusing <laughs> to them than, than possible. But okay. uh, <laughs> but uh, what it uh, really says is that um, that the California courts cannot interpret integration school, uh, mm -hmm. school integration plans uh, any tougher than the federal court yes. has already interpreted. And some people and think that if that occurs, it would uh, remove what, what is now intended yeah. in the Los Angeles busing. Right. Well, the intent of the people that are pushing the measure, of course, is mm -hmm. that uh, they're saying that uh, school busing in the Southern California region is tougher than, uh, than what the federal courts would rule. Mm -hmm. So they're saying that uh, if, we have this, if we have this amendment passed, then the, the Los Angeles schools could not, could not uh, force busing. Yes, let's, let, uh, let me read a paragraph from your own, uh, your office's ballot, so maybe that'll be helpful to any viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, read what the official paragraphs say. This is the people who are arguing in favor of Proposition 1, who think that you should vote yes. Uh, it's signed by Reverend Jackson. Currently, the California Constitution can be interpreted to require compulsory busing including metropolitan compulsory busing in circumstances where busing would not be required by the Constitution of the United States of America. The intent and purpose of my judgment is to prohibit any California judge from ordering a mandatory busing unless the busing is required by federal law. That portion is signed by Alan Robbins, who is the author of it. In other words, he is saying you ought to vote yes. Now, the people who are saying you ought to vote no is Diane Watson, Teresa Hughes, and Susan Rice. Contrary to the promises made by the amendment supporters, neither desegregation in Los Angeles nor the busing used to tool, as a tool to achieve it would come to a halt with the passage of this measure. In the Los Angeles school integration case, the trial court found and the state Supreme Court agreed that the segregation resulted from official acts of the school board. Even if the California Constitution were, be, were to be amended to make the so-called federal standard on desegregation apply in California uh, intentional, segregation would still require a remedy not only in Los Angeles but in other school districts all over the state. I hope we've made that clear with the arguments on both sides. Sometimes I, I prefer to read the analysis than I do the arguments because the analysis really tell you what the what the measure does mm -hmm. and of course in the final analysis no matter which way you argue pro or con uh, if you vote yes you're saying yeah, you want yeah. the federal laws to apply that's right and if you vote no you're saying that the the state can so step we in. want to just go as uh, we just as want we to are. be as we are, right? right. Well, let's take a look at number two: loan interest rates. Uh, and I think we can just discuss that verbally for a moment. On loans other than for personal, family, or household purposes, permits interest rates higher than 10 percent. Financial impact: no direct fiscal effect on the state. Uh, had to do with uh, charging rates more than 10 percent, mm -hmm. and the people in favor of it say that with this inflation we're going into, 10 percent doesn't do it anymore. Well, as uh, I understand the measure. Uh, what it says is that uh, presently uh, banks and savings and loans institu institutions can charge so much interest on loans, mm -hmm. but mortgage companies are not permitted to go that uh, extent because the yes. Constitution has written them off. And what this does is give them uh, equi equity in, this, uh, in the field. Uh, let me read the, uh, just one paragraph from, from the argument, again from the booklet. Because 10% is not enough today, many lenders no longer loan money in California, although others who are now exempt from the usury law still do. For example, mortgage bankers who last year provided $13 billion for housing loans in California are limited to a 10% rate, and in 1979 they practically abandoned providing conventional mortgage loans. Mm -hmm. The other side, the people who are against Proposition 2 say Proposition 2 would weaken California's usury laws by boosting interest rates on certain loans above the current 10% maximum. Eroding those laws would be a misstep in the direction of higher costs and tighter money. Uh, someone has to make that judgment in the ballot booth. Let's take a look at Proposition 3, and I think that's probably the least uh, subject to argument of any of them because it's more or less just a change in wording. In fact, if I remember correctly, there is no opposing argument, is No, there? in Proposition 3, it doesn't even appear in the ballot. There's no argument against no, it. No, proposition 3, though, let's read it. Requires legislature to adjust the valuation of veterans accessible property if assessment ratio is changed. Financial impact, no effect on the amount of property taxes levied, no effect on the tax liability of taxpayers claiming the veterans exemption, minor initial cost to the government. Uh, do you want to summarize what that is saying in a nutshell? Well, that uh, really is kind of a technical measure. 
and basically nothing very much is going to change except the language which uh, and the language doesn't make that much change what we're doing now is uh, saying that when we assess property we assess it that 20% 25. of its 25, 25 of its market mm -hmm. value and now as say it will change and say no it, it'll be at 100% but at the same time that you come mm -hmm. out it's equal to the same amount. But you'd pay the same tax bill, right, except because, because of Proposition 13, 13 they, they print on it 100% of one, what the assessor thinks your house is worth. Right. Doing. And then you pay the 1% right. that Prop 13 says you have to pay. That's why no, what we, we no uh, issued, arguments against it. Yeah, we issued a statewide uh, announcement saying there's no argument against Proposition 3. Would someone please write an argument against it? And we received none. Couldn't find any. But I, you didn't have any problem with that on Proposition 4, I No. Uh, proposition 4 having to do with, certainly with the very hot issue of... Uh, the GAN initiative. So, do you want to? Uh, well, that's uh, that's kind of um, I guess the most simple simplified way of explaining that is it uh, places a ceiling on how much government can spend for certain programs, and then it does have a a little uh, loophole, so to speak, so that if for some reason there is some emergency or uh, or crisis, the the we can spend extra monies on these kinds of programs, but what it, it's kind of a follow-up to Proposition 13, where we're we're trying to put a cap on government spending. All right, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a reading on this. When you go into the ballot place on November 6th, this is what you're going to find: limitation of government appropriations. That's Proposition 4. It establishes annual appropriation limits for state and local governments. Financial impact indeterminable. Financial impact of this measure will depend upon future actions of state and local governments with regard to appropriations that are not subject to the limitations of this measure. Uh, what should we say about that one? There's been so much about it, but that I suppose you can say if you vote yes, you're saying you want to have a limitation put on state spending where it's gauged to the cost of living growth and to the population growth. Right. If you don't think that that should be on there, you ought to go and vote no. That's, that's about the size of it. Uh, do you think that's an, a hot enough issue to pull people out? Uh, it's an it's an inter it's a an, an issue which is of great interest to many people. But uh, what I understand from um, the supporters of that issue that uh, they've taken polls and they say that it's uh, so highly favored favored in the polls. I think something like 61 percent of the people responding to it said that they favor the issue. What they're what they're afraid of is that if they don't get the vote to come out, they won't get that 61 percent of the vote. Yes. So um, I'd like to read a paragraph. I think it sums it up very well from the pro side. The people who are saying yes, and this happened to be by Leo McCarthy, uh, member of the assembly and speaker of the assembly. Proposition 4 is a thoughtfully drafted spending limit. It will require state and local government to limit their budgets, yet provide for reasonable growth and meet emergencies. It will not require wholesale cuts in necessary services. Californians want quality education, health service, police, and fire protection. On the no side, the people who think you should vote no is Jonathan Lewis, uh, director of the California Tax Reform Association, Susan Rice, president of League of Women Voters, and John Henning, who is Executive Secretary Treasurer of California Federation, uh, Labor Federation, AFL-CIO. They are writing, Proposition 4 does not guarantee that the fat will be cut from the government. Proposition 4 is not tax reform. Proposition 4 is instead a rash measure that places a straitjacket on government at the very moment when Californians are faced with an uncertain economic future. Uh, what about certifying that? Uh, I know that you get into, sometimes there are disputes about the counts and all that kind of thing. Well, how does your office handle that? Well, in certifying the initiative for the ballot, we don't get in really not that much controversy because if the people have collected the proper number of signatures and uh, and uh, we we allow the public to view it for 20 days and then mm -hmm. if no one has protested the wording uh, that we're going to use in the handbook, then it's kind of a routine thing to have it uh, have it printed. Here in Orange County, we're going to have 28 school districts who are having special elections. Of course, this is at the time when school districts all over the state are having it. We're also having 19 special districts. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that some of these school districts generate enough heat, the uh, community college district races, do they generate enough heat to pull people in for the ballots, or is it the other way around that the ballots, if they're hot enough, will pull people in who might otherwise not bother to go to, say, a school district election. Well, I think the local elections tied on to this special election are going to help uh, generate more voters to come out, because with each election there are going to be uh, people who are campaigning for the issue of their choice, and uh, 
for the school board in the local elections. Each candidate's probably going to have his little group of volunteers and supporters, and they're going to be urging people to go vote for their supporters. Mm -hmm. So I think, in a way, the local elections uh, that are tied in with the statewide election will be of help in generating more, uh, more voter turnout. Let's talk a little bit. Well, you certainly hope that people do come out on November 6th, and we hope that if we can make even two or three more percent by this program, we'll, we'll feel very good about that. Let's talk a little bit about the system itself. Uh, you've seen so much study of the initiative process. You've done a very strong and lengthy study on it. You've seen the California the history of the, uh, the initiative. What kind of predictions are you making as we look to the future in initiatives? Well, you, you're right. We did do a study of it. In fact, very recently, my office published a study of the initiative process. And uh, if any of your viewers are interested in a copy, they can write me and uh, we'd be happy to send it to them. It's kind of an historical uh, I think it's study. the most definitive thing in the literature of the subject uh, to date. Yes, we were, we, were the, we were fortunate in having a student intern who was uh, doing, a, doing a study in that, who was interested in that field, so we worked with her and helped mm -hmm. her get all the material through our state archives. And I think she produced a very excellent report. And uh, it kind of, as you say, is very definitive of the whole system and how it started. Mm -hmm. It started in 1911, many years ago, when uh, Hiram Johnson was still uh, was governor. And at that time, the Southern Pacific had a very strong hold on the legislature. I mean, anything Southern Pacific said, they got. And so the people were very unhappy with that. And, uh, and uh, they decided to pass this initiative system whereby they could take hold of it, the system and say that if they want certain laws, the people could pass mm -hmm. them. So this, this initiative system began then. Even then, though, we were still, you, you thought, you might think it was an, a novel idea, but it really wasn't because we were the 10th state to do it. But, mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're not as alarmed as some of these legislators we were talking about a little before who say that, it's a, uh, that it takes away from the legislature the right to legislate, particularly well, when does. you lock it into the Constitution. Well, it does do that, yes. And, uh, like I think Prop 13, for example. That's right. The, you, have to, you have to go through the Constitution and do another um, uh, proposition, another initiative mm -hmm. to, to do any, any amending to it. And um, there are examples where we shouldn't be doing something like that. Uh, but you defend the, the system and the process. You defend it as, as a, I a very good I right defend, to be... I defend the availability of it because yes. I think it speaks very strongly that, uh, uh, that the people have a voice mm -hmm. in their government. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the issue is strong enough, it's going to get somewhere. We've had, as uh, you saw in our study, a well over 400 um, initiatives that mm -hmm. have been proposed in California since 1911. Mm -hmm. And roughly... 10% of those uh, ha were actually passed. So it's not that many. Ten, well, 10% mm -hmm. is quite a few, I suppose. It's a little over 40 that have passed during, since 1911, 60-some years. But it's really, it's really not as if we, we keep passing them right and left because yes. the, the process is rather difficult to get the initiative. But it's a good process to hang on to, you think? It, I think it's a good process to hang on to. If I'm a legislator, I'd probably say no because I want to be... You want to be able to call those shots. <laughs> right. uh, two... Two initiatives are coming up right now. I mean, they're, they're being talked about very much right now and worked on right now. One of them is uh, the Jarvis Second Initiative, which would cut state income taxes in half. We're talking now about the, probably the June 1980 election, mm -hmm. uh, the Jarvis Two initi uh, Initiative. And the other one that uh, apparently is getting a lot of attention is the idea of school by vouchers. Wilson Riles has said that it would virtually destroy public education as we know it. Mm -hmm. If every parent in the state is given a voucher and then you take your voucher to go get your child educated at any private school. Mm -hmm. uh, what about those two initiatives? Is there, is there a lot of action on those now? I think uh, well, the, we, we don't have any results and we don't really uh, start getting the results in terms of how many signatures are on the petition until it gets close to that mm -hmm. time. Uh, so, but I would anticipate Jarvis did, the, such, a, did such a good organization on his uh, Prop 13. Prop 13 yeah. He probably still has the um, the organizational structure to put this one across too, and I suspect that he most likely will be able to um, get it on the ballot. And uh, when you say cut property taxes, like he said in 13, well, everybody's ready to sign it. And when because you say cut income tax, everyone's going to be ready yeah. to sign. She said, I'd rather suspect uh, just my own personal guess is that he'll be able to um, get that certified. Uh, the voucher system, I understand, is um, is very, very uh, controversial. Yes, very it's, controversial. Um, public, uh, I've been talking to some of, 
uh, my friends in public education, and they're very, very concerned about it. And so they are actually going to launch a drive. A big to, drive against it. Uh, I would think that would be a very uh, vitriolic uh, issue mm -hmm. between now and June. Uh, and more to come, I suppose, on those both. Well, of those if. If the uh, proponents aren't able to get enough I signatures, then of course it won't even appear in a ballot. You have been very critical of Governor Brown in the past. Uh, for example, you were very unhappy with his action in cutting the budget from the Department of Commerce because that, in effect, stopped the effort to bring in new business. And you've been active in trying to bring new business to the state yourself. Uh, are you still provoked with the governor for not doing enough? Uh, to bring business to California? Well, I like to think that what I, I did when I talked to you last, Jim, was that uh, you, you said I was critical, and I, I like to think that what I was, was saying at that time was constructive criticism, mm -hmm. and indeed, it ended, criticism, and indeed yeah. it ended up to be constructive criticism, mm -hmm. because as, I, um, as when he eliminated the Commerce Department that encouraged doing more business. And you were kind of mad about that. I was kind of, well, I wasn't the only one. Yes. <laughs> a business, a California business was uh, a little mm -hmm. upset with them, and Cal people who are into, into export development and international trade were a little upset with them. But uh, I'm happy to say he, uh, about four years later, he finally got the message, and he has again reinstituted an economic and uh, business development. Uh, office with an international trade element to it. Not a very big office, but uh, at least he, he got the message. And so... So you're got, partly there, but not all the way there. Well, no, that's right. We're partly okay. there. But right. I continue to do what I'm doing because uh, I right. have, um, I have as, as chief of protocol, I have really access to a lot of the uh, counselor corps people who are busily working in California. To develop trade for To California. develop well, really, to sell their country's goods to our people in California. And so I'm still acting as a one-person um, uh, foreign trade mission. Uh, a mission. A one-person mission <laughs> one to person sell our products and to sell, them. And sell our sure. things to them. <laughs> well, I think that you're, you're, uh, that's a good project. I think no one could quarrel with you that, whether they're Democrat or Republican. Uh, there have been a lot of headlines of squabbles and fight going on between Governor Brown and Mike Kerb, when, as you know, when the governor goes out of the state. Uh, what do you do about that when you get an order that, that, for example, a judge being appointed? How do you handle that? Uh, well, I battle? am handling it the same way the secretaries of state have handled it since the beginning of California. We presume that, and 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 uh, every secretary of state since since then has presumed that when the governor leaves the state, state boundaries, of California, the lieutenant, the lieutenant governor is charge. the acting governor, or is until the governor in charge and, until the governor comes back. And so consequently, when the lieutenant governor, who is acting governor, does anything, uh, we you just do the routine thing. Uh, there have been rumors that you intend to run for senator against Hayakawa in 1982, or perhaps even for governor in 1982. What do you have to say about that? Well, those rumors um, are not started by me. Uh, they probably are started by my supporters and my friends who would like me to do that. I myself am very uh, busy being a very good Secretary of State, doing a, as best a job as I can do. And then uh, if three years from now when my term is up, if I've done a good job, the people can either promote me, keep me where I am. If I did a, I've done a bad job, they'll probably get rid of me. But you're not closing the door. <laughs> Our time is about up. I want to thank you very much for being with us. This has been a special broadcast for public television with March Fong Yu, Secretary of State of the State of California. I'm Jim Cooper. Thanks for being with us.